Okay, so um, we're going to continue our discussion of the skeleton. Uh, last week we went over chapter seven, part one and two covered the axial skeleton. Again, I'm hoping by breaking down the skeleton into these, well, I mean, the, the chapters naturally did it, breaking it down into two sections and those two sections into two parts. It makes, um, I guess, knowing the bones and kind of memorizing these bones a little bit more palatable. So again, please make sure that you're staying on top of this material, watching these lectures in a spaced out manner and making sure you're sitting down and spending some time actually memorizing uh, those bones that are associated with each section. I think I'm going to start putting together kind of an abbreviated study guide, um, just listing off all the bones that are, you're going to be required to know, maybe even making like a little, you know, uh, study guide, study sheet um, with the labels kind of associated with it. So that might be um, part of my homework uh, for the week. Okay, uh, so this week we're going to uh, dive into the appendicular skeleton. Uh, again, these are kind of the extensions off of the axial skeleton. Uh, these bones are generally required for movement, so we're going to be talking about the, both the uh, arms and legs, probably more commonly known, uh, that allows us to, you know, interact with our environment in a more efficient way. Okay, so uh, as per usual, uh, please make sure that you're answering your study guides for question, the questions for Chapter 8 prior to coming to the class. On Tuesday and Thursday. If you have not been attending class, please make sure that you pop into one of these classes. Uh, we've uh, essentially made it far more efficient uh, having you fill out your study guides collectively um, on a Word document. And so if you have any questions about that, please feel free to ask me about that. Um, but that does mean because we are more efficient with that time, that I'm able to dedicate a little bit more time to going over the material, presenting some possible questions um, in that review session. And what I end up doing is going through both the study guide questions that we um, we end up answering the study guide questions, going over the study guide questions, and then getting some possible, let's say, exam questions sprinkled in there as well. Um, some of them are as simple as pointing an arrow pointing to a bone saying, what bone is this? But it's nice because it just kind of makes you think about the material again and again and again. Okay, uh, make sure you do quiz eight, uh, which is due by midnight Friday. I actually think it might be quiz seven, but uh, I have to go back and look at the grade book to make sure that's in fact the case. Um, homework eight, the adaptive practice chapter nine is due the following Monday, and that's when we take our turn from the skeleton into the muscular system. And, and these chapters are situated very similar to the way that the um, bone and skeleton chapters were, where we first talk about kind of the individual cellular composition of those particular, the particular organ system, um, or I guess system. Um, in this case, we're talking about, we talked about bones kind of as individual components, and then we talked about bones as, as they're put together kind of in the skeleton themselves in chapter um, seven and eight. Okay, so the muscles are going to be kind of situated the same way. Okay, so study guide questions. Uh, we're going to go over the pectoral sh shoulder girdle, uh, things like the clavicle, scapula, um, then we'll extend our conversation to the upper limb, uh, humerus, and then we'll finish by talk by an introduction into the hip bone. And the hip bone is where we'll kick off with uh, chapter eight, part two. Okay, so we have 206 bones in, the, in our skeleton. Uh, the appendicular skeleton has 126. Now that might seem like a lot of bones to you, but recognize there are pairs of bones here, right? We're seeing, um, you know, again, we are kind of mirror images of each side of the, of the skeleton. So you can see here um, those bones. And so uh, we have quite a few in our hands and our feet. And so we're going to go over some mnemonic devices to kind of keep those straight, um, particularly in this lecture. And essentially the, the, um, the focus or the function of our appendages is, is, to, um, uh, is going to allow movement. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about how um, these, particular, uh, these particular bones systems um, attach to the axial skeleton and then also allow for movement with, or with um, specific tendons attaching to uh, muscles. Again, because the, one of the main functions is going to be movement, it's going to be important that your muscles are attaching to these bones and then all allowing for that, uh, that actual force um, for the generation of movement. Okay, so the two pectoral shoulder girdles involve the clavicle and the scapula. So here we have our clavicle, this kind of S-shaped bone here, and then you have your scapula, which, you know, you would think of 
uh, right here. Um, people might call it more commonly the shoulder blade. Um, so you have your clavicle and your scapula. So um, in terms of points of articulation, the clavica is, clavicle is going to articulate with the sternum here. That um, articulation is joined together at the sternoclavicular joint. Um, again, these articulation points I'm not going to require you to know. I think it's just a nice way to be, be able to put this all into context and how things come together. So um, for your scapula, so again, clavicle, sternum, go together at the sternoclavicle joint. I'll change colors now. And so for the scapula, here you can see um, ac acroclavicle um, articulation. So for this, this particular joint, um, you see kind of the combination of the, or the articulation of the clavicle and the scapula. Um, the last kind of, I guess, articulation point that's worth Noting here, I see I just I took these notes and I, I because I thought it would be very um, useful. And so your whoop, you your glenio glenohumeral joint um, that's going to be the articulation point of the humerus. Um, and the glenohumeral is going to be the not spreading the uh, scapula and the humerus. Okay, so uh, I'm just using colors here to kind of show the different articulation points of, of where each one of these uh, pectoral girdles are, are coming uh, together. And so you have your sternoclavicular with your clavicle and your sternum. Nomenclature makes a lot of sense. Your acro your joint is your clavicle and your scapula, and then your glenohumeral joint, which is your scapula and your humerus. And so we'll talk about each one of those um, in a second. I just try to be very careful because I don't want to misspeak here. Um, as I'm circling things. Okay, I think I'm second up by my notes. Um, so if you are, again, somebody who finds these animations very useful, um, this might be a video worth watching. I know some folks are very hungry for more supplementary material for this course. And so if you are one of those students who just says, you know, I need to consume as much as I can. I need to see everything from every possible angle, have it presented to me in several different ways. Please do feel free to pull up this PowerPoint, open up your um, open up your browser, and click on this link, and it should send you right to Wiley Plus, where you should be able to watch a video related to this material. Okay, so now we're going to kind of just zoom in on, on some of these bones that we just talked about. So. Uh, the clavicle is a is essentially what we'd more commonly call the collar collarbone. It's S shaped. Um, I think in the textbooks it says it's you know sub. Uh, it's below the skin. I'm just like, hmm, it's interesting that they felt like they had to uh, state that, but you can feel it um, on an individual. So it's just located right below subdural, right below that skin. Uh, the medial or sternal end articulates with the mandibrum of the sternum. And so here you have the sternal end here. So if you were, that's probably not, I, I guess I could just draw the sternum in. Uh, so here you would have your, oh, your sternum on this side and your sternal end. Um, so, it, and it would be uh, articulated with the mandibrum. And the lateral or acrimonial end is going to ar articulate with the acrimen of the scapula. And so this is the um, region here that's going to articulate with the uh, scapula that we saw uh, just in the previous uh, slide. So again, this is showing you the two places in which the clavicle articulates and interacts. It's an S-shaped curve. It's located right there. Um, again, it's a very kind of, it's got a close interaction point with the, um, with the axial skeleton. Again, the uh, sternum would be part of the axial skeleton. And so this is again, one of the points in which we're seeing the interaction of the two kind of regions that we've been discussing. Um, let's see, the scapula is the shoulder girdle. Um, flat bone that's located in the superior part of the posterior thorax between the second and seventh ribs. So again, if we're, if we're looking at the axial skeleton, we've, we've got those 12 ribs um, that exist there. And so this is going to exist between the second and the seventh. The glenoid cavity, cavity again, when we talk about uh, points of articulation, the glenoid cavity is going to be a point of uh, articulation with the humerus. And so here you can see that glenoid cavity and not surprisingly kind of has that, that um, open cavernous shape that you would expect for an articula articulation point. So the um, epiphysis um, of the of the humerus can um, fit nicely inside there. And so this is going to be your interior view. If we look at your posterior view, um, again, you're looking at kind of the, the backside of this. Um, 
you're not able to see that glenoid cavity nearly as easily. But other things worth kind of um, pointing, note, I guess, taking note of, but you won't necessarily need to know, is its infraspinous um, fossa, kind of the large major part of this body that you see here. And then if we're looking at, you know, examples of some of the terminology we learned in chapter seven, here's the superior angle of the superior border and the scapular notch all located here, here, and here. And since supraspinous fossa is located, you know, in, the, in this region here. Um, the glenoid cavity, again, is a little bit more difficult, I think, to see in the posterior view, but then if we go to a lateral view, you can really see it straight on here. Again, that's going to be the part, the articulation point for the humerus. And so um, you can see all these things that we've labeled um, in the posterior view are also labeled um, in the anterior view. And again, it's just kind of a review of some of the nomenclature that we learned in chapter seven, but I'm not gonna be asking, pointing to specific um, components of the scapula and asking you to describe them um, because I'm asking you to hopefully memorize all 206 bones. I feel like that's kind of where we should be at for a 100 level course. Now, if you if your future is in um, exercise physiology and things like that, if you have the time and you'd like to dedicate that time to memorizing um, a deeper level of understanding here, by all means, go crazy. Okay. Uh, so, uh, kind of extending off of that um, main girdle that we just talked about um, would be the humerus or arm bone, I guess is more commonly known. It articulates with the scapula proximally, so we just talked about that glenial humeral um, joint that forms there. Um, and then also articulates with the rainus and the ulna distally. And so we talk about proximal versus distal. So here's going to be your distal joint, your proximal joint. Your proximal joint is going to be that glenear humeral joint. Um, the trochlea articulates with the ulna and the captium with the radius. Um, when we're talking about uh, that, we're gonna talk about how the, what the ulna is particularly um, articulates with just in terms of memorizing kind of what side of the hand it's going to, to fit into. Um, so, Okay, so if we look at some images here of the humerus, the radius, and the ulna, uh, again, we'll just start off with what, we, what we've previously covered here. Here you have your clavicle, here you have your scapula, the scapula and then you have that um, glenoid cavity, and then here you have the greater tubercle of the humerus. So again, often when we've been discussing long bones, we've been talking about the humerus as a great example of a, of a long bone. Uh, when we talked about the structure of bone in chapter six, remember we talked about how this area is called the diaphysis, this is the epiphysis, and then you've got this region here called the metaphysis. I'm just throwing this out there as a review. View. Again, if these words are still a little fuzzy to you, it's worth going back and maybe revisiting that material a little bit because, again, it applies here um, as we're still um, discussing bones. Um, so you can see that uh, greater tubercle, the lesser tubercle here, and then that intertubercle sulcus here. And a sulcus is generally going to be kind of a a valley or a groove. Um, when we get to talking about the brain, we'll, that terminology will still stay true where you've got sulci and gyri, but that's, you know, we'll talk about that when we get there. But it's nice when there's some overlap here in terms of using the, the, the verbiage. Um, this would be considered the deltoid tuberosity here. And again, this is just kind of the humerus is like um, labeling the entire humerus as this entire long, um, long bone. The body of the shaft, not surprisingly, is kind of the diaphysis that we see here. And then we see this other point of articulation here uh, down near the, um, the joint uh, but that is conjoining the radius and the ulna. So here you can see the radius um, kind of um, on the outside of this. And again, we're looking at standard anatomical view. So the palms are going to be um, facing um, out. And so, like this. Um, you can kind of see it, I guess, right here um, on the larger image, but again, that kind of helps you keep in, in orientation when we're talking about things like the radius, the ulna, and then what um, bones of the hand they'll be um, articulating or they'll be interacting with or kind of on the same uh, side of. Okay, so you have your radius, you have your ulna. ulna. If we, again, look at some of the structures that we've talked about in chapter uh, six, uh, you'll have your radial fossa, your lateral epicondyle, um, your cavitium, um, and then you have your um, coronoid fossa, and that's again just structures within the bone. 
uh, that help you um, understand, again, the structures of these bones are going to be related directly to their function. And you've got a lot of kind of grooves and tuberosities and, and you know, um, condyles and epicondyles, especially on those epiphyseal ends, because they're coming to articulate with other bones. Okay. Okay, so uh, we talked about the humerus and then the radius and the ulna. Um, and those are going to be the two bones within the forearm. Um, the ulcocarinon and the coronary process at the proximal end of the ulna form the trochlear notch, which wraps around the trochle trochlea of the humerus, making up the elbow joint. And so we saw uh, some of that articulation in the previous figure. The radius is located on the lateral thumb side of the forearm. So again, if you were looking at standard anatomical view, your radius is going to be on your thumb side, and then your uh, ulna is going to be on your pinky side. Uh, one of the ways that in the book that it was stated to remember this is think of PU, and that would be um, pinky and ulna. PU, uh, pinky and ulna uh, go together, and then uh, radius and thumb via process of elimination go together. So PU, uh, pinky and ulna. Okay, so here we see uh, the image of these bones. Again, your head of the ulna is shown here, the styloid process of the radius here. So we see the radius on the outside. Again, that's going to be on the thumb side. And then you have your ulna side here. And again, that's going to be your pinky side. Um, wow, that's not the greatest drawing of a pinky. Um, but again, it just shows you that the articulation, uh, the, sty the styloid process of the ulna and how you have in um, your articulation with the carpals here. Um, this is on your distal end. If we look at um, um, your uh, proximal end here, here, you can see again the coordinate process, the head of the radius, the neck of the radius. Again, when we were talking about ribs, we kind of saw that same description of, of neck and head. And then you have your radial tuberosity here, your ulnar, ulnar top tuberosity here. So this is just a, again a really nice image. It's showing the anterior view of the radius and the ulna. Um, and then here you can see some interosteous membrane, uh, basically kind of conjoining uh, the two bones. Okay, so if we look at um, kind of the, this, uh, <laughs> if we go ahead and zoom in on, on the joint specifically here, you can see that medial ep epicondyle of the humerus and how it's articulating here with this uh, coronoid process. And then you have your head of the radi radius here that fits nicely into the capitium and the trochlear um, is also going to be um, in that general region. Uh, you also see that there's a nice radial tuberosity here um, as part of uh, that uh, point of articulation. Okay. Um, again, many of these like subregions and where articulations and tuberosities and trochlear, um, I'm not going to ask you to know, um, but I am just again putting it kind of all in context. Um, I think one other figure here that's kind of worth looking at here is the ulna. And here you can see uh, because it's removed that nice trochlear notch as well as that coronate proce process and that radial notch. Again, these notches are going to allow for those um, other bones to articulate really smoothly there and form that um, joint that allows for um, the movement of these uh, large long bones uh, together. Okay, so we're working our way kind of um, uh, down the arm um, to more distal regions. And so here you can see that we're going to um, first talk about the carpal bones. They're going to be connected um, each other by ligaments and are arranged in two rows and four bones each. This is more commonly probably known as that, uh, that wrist region there. And so the proximal um, wrist and then the, uh, the basis um, of the hand. And so just want to make sure I have uh, a note here ready. Okay, and so uh, in terms of these, uh, there's <laughs> quite a few uh, small bones and names that, that we're gonna have to start to uh, kind of dig in and memorize here. And so the proximal row versus the distal row, again, proximal kind of closer to the, the center of the body and distal being a little further out, you have your scaphoid, your lunate, your uh, tri <laughs> tricretum, and your pisiform. Um, I guess in the textbook it notes kind of uh, words at these particular or the shapes of these bones and kind of how these shapes give, give rise to this 
nomenclature, the scaphoid um, like apparently is similar to a boat, moonate, lunate, moon, um, triquium, I think uh, three, it's got three kind of sides to it, and then pisiform, which would be uh, P. Um, the distal row of these uh, carpals, you have your trapezium, your trapezoid, your capitate, and your hamate. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the shapes again would be hooked, uh, or sorry, uh, four-sided with no two parallel sides. Uh, then you'd have four-sided with two parallel sides. Um, this, I guess, is in the shape of a head. And then you have a hooked shape to uh, this final bone here. And those are going to articulate with your metacarpals. Um, so again, these are very specific uh, kind of nomenclature or names. And so usually when you have something like this, a mnemonic device can be very helpful. So um, the mnemonic device that's suggested in the textbook, which kind of has a catchy tune to it. Um, stop letting those people touch the Cadaver, which again probably overlaps pretty well with the the um, content that we're discussing here. Oh man, now I can't click back into it. Um, so uh, you can see scaphoid, stop, letting, lunate, triquetum, those, pisiform, people, trapezium, touch, trapezoid, the, capitate cadaver, and then I'm not quite sure what happens. What happens? Oh, cadaver's hand. Cadaver's hand. That's the last word there. Cadaver's hand. So that's how you get the the H. Oof, that writing is rough. Um, so again, this is just a, a, a one of the mnemonic devices that has been suggested. Um, this is the one that's in the textbook. But if you come up with something that's just a little bit more catchy, that makes more sense to you, by all means, please use that. Um, just because you've, again, this is where the memorization I think can get maybe the, the most difficult, is because you're dealing with words that maybe you haven't thought about. You know, humorous, radius, ulna, those are things that maybe you've heard of before. Very infrequently, I think, have people heard of many of the names of the carpal bones. Okay, so um, going from, again, proximal to distal, um, you have the five metacarpals that make up the palm in the back of the hand, and those are going to be numbered one through five. One thumb, pick up one thumb, that's how the numbering goes. One thumb, one is, <laughs> I keep saying it, one thumb. Uh, the bases articulate with the distal carp carpals with their heads articulating with the proximal phalanges. And so again, you've got your carpals, you have your metacarpals, and then you have your phalanges. So your phalanges are going to be the bones of the digits. There are 14 total here. The thumb is going to contain two and then your other four fingers are going to have three and they'll have a proximal middle and distal I don't know why I did that proximal middle and distal so that's uh, ultimately kind of how that so make sure you feel really comfortable with the terminology of proximal and distal again it's going to become um, useful here and then uh, memorizing numbers and things like that are also going to be uh, useful okay let me get this uh, erased up here do, 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 do. okay so this is again where the memorization gets a little, kind of, I guess, heady because you've got a lot going on here. We can see our radius, we can see our ulna. Again, ulna P U is on the pinky. Um, radius is on the thumb side. And so here you can see your scaphoid, trapezium, capitate, trapezoid, all located um, right here. And again, these are giving kind of rise to those different uh, shapes that we talked about, and then your carpals, your lunate, pisiform, triquium, and harnate. Um, you can see your lunate, pisiform, triquium, oh, then your hamate. Okay, um, and then in for, for numbers, you have one thumb, so one, two, three, four, five, and then your, um, your proximal, and distal, and you have your one, sorry, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then one and two. So these are your metacarpals, 
And these would be your phalanges that you see um, out here. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna go through this slide just a little bit more slowly because there is a lot of information here and I'm gonna use some different colors. So let's first start with the carpals. So your carpals are located here. Um, your carpals, as we went over before, stop letting those people touch <laughs> touch the cadaver's hand, okay? So stop right here, letting the, those people, let's see, touch the cadaver's then hand is also located in here. So those are your carpals. We go and we move into the metacarpals, right located here. Those are numbered one through five. One, two, three, four, five. And then lastly, you have your um, phalanges. So one, two, one, two, whoop, sorry, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three, going from proximal to distal. Okay. Again, I've, I've done a bunch of circling on this guy. You can do circling on this guy if you so like. Mnemonic device for those carpal, <laughs> carpal bones. Stop letting those people touch the cadaver's hand. It's kind of actually written out here. And you can see um, it's, uh, what's nice about this mnemonic device. It also goes through the lateral to medial sides of the proximal row and then the distal row from lateral to medial. So um, it's worth probably just spending a little bit of time on this particular slide and make sure you feel comfortable. And I know, again, this, is a, this slide has a lot of um, stuff on it that you'll have to memorize, um, but just recognize that this kind of, I guess, compensates or kind of offsets some of those slides where I show you where I'm showing you a bunch of, you know, tuberosities and trochanters and epicondyles and I'm saying, don't pay attention to that. This is actually where you should be spending your time is on um, a slide like this. Okay, um, so <laughs> we've talked about kind of the superior part, uh, the superior girdle of the abdicular skeleton. So I guess we could talk about the inferior one now, the pelvic or the hip girdle. So we'll talk, begin our discussion about the, the pelvic girdle today, and then we'll continue that discussion um, on uh, Thursday, or I guess when we're reviewing it. So the pelvic girdle is made up of two hip bones, um, coxal bones that uh, articulate with the sacrum posteriorly. So again, um, right there at the base of your back, you've got that sacrum interacting with the pelvic girdle. Each bone is made up of three components. So you have the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And so we're gonna look at uh, each one of those um, on the following slides. The two bones articulate anteriorly with the pubic bones, the pubic symphysis, and there's a disc of fibrocartilage between the two bones. And again, this disc of fibrocartilage um, has uh, an opportunity to kind of soften and become like a little more pliable during periods of your life like childbirth. <laughs> okay, so the pelvic girdle, again, if you are a very visual learner and you like videos, great opportunity to watch a video. Okay. So uh, the pelvic hip, hip girdle, let's go ahead and break down the large components of it. Here you have your ilium, here you have your ischium, and here you have your pubis. Um, in terms of all of these different kind of tuberosities, sacrum notch, again, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize those, so I almost don't. It's worth at least recognizing th the larger kind of points. Things like the iliac crest, that's kind of, again, that most, um, that part of your hip bone that probably kind of sticks out the most at that iliac crest. Uh, here you can see the tubercle of the iliac, iliac crest. Here you can see some gluteal, gluteal lines, inferior, anterior, inferior, and posterior. Um, and then also things to um, kind of recognize is you have your acetabellum, and uh, we'll be talking specifically about what articulates in that region. Um, here's your arbitrary foramen, and we'll talk about a little bit um, what passes through that region. Um, and this is, again, all the, the lateral view. If we switch it over to the medial view, you can still see that iliac press. Um, and here you can see more clearly an iliac, fo iliac fossa. Um, and then that arbitrary forum, kind of from a different, uh, different vantage point. Um, all the other kind of tuberosities and notches and things like that, not going to have you know. The iliac crest is probably like the most apparent visual kind of um, 
uh, I guess landmark of the of the hip bone. So that might be the only one that I would ask you about. Okay, so the head of the femur articulates with the um, acetalbum, which I pointed out in the last uh, slide, of uh, the hip bone as kind of a, as a ball and socket joint. Now, unfortunately, we won't be covering the chapter of, of joints in this particular course, um, but we will be um, talking about this articulation point. Uh, the acetalbum is, is composed of all of the three of the bones that make up the um, hip bone. So if we look back here, you can see the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. Um, that's going to be right there, um, kind of in the center. Uh, the antecedent is right there in the center of all three of those regions. Okay, so the pelvis is divided up into superior and inferior bones by the pelvic brim, which is where the abdomen meets the pelvic cavity. So here we can again see a different kind of orientation um, of it. So you can see how the two hip bones come together and um, in your, this is an anterior superior view. So you can see your sacral commentary here and how it fits nicely um, within the pelvic girdle. Um, and then you have your pelvic brim located right here. And then you have your pubic crest located here. And then that pubic um, synthesis uh, right here. Again, during, um, during childbirth, this becomes a little bit softer, a little bit more malleable because those hips are going to open up uh, for the process of childbirth. I guess I'm kind of, I find that really interesting because I just went through the process itself. And so there are hormones and, and, and you know, messaging systems that tell your body to kind of uh, relax and kind of open up those hips. And it's not a joke, man. Like, your hips really do open up and you kind of lose a little bit of your stability. You can, and I, I can speak from firsthand experience, you really do feel it. You feel like, um, it feels like your, your hips are kind of coming apart. It feels like your legs are not dis as, uh, there's just a lot of pain in that region. Not pain, but it just feels very different. It's interesting. Um, okay, so in terms of the hip girdle, uh, you have the uh, greater or false pelvis. So we can see that false pelvis as you see here. Again, this is showing you um, a mid sagittal section. So you basically have slice the, the 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 pelvis in half. So here you can see that cross section of it. So uh, you'll see here that um, kind of bottom of the of the spinal column. You have your sacrum and your coccyx located there. You can see how it's kind of tipped um, the plane of the pel pelvic outlet. And so here you have your false pelvis, and then here you have your um, what's called true pelvis or your lesser pelvis, the false pelvis. Um, again, it's a little, a little bit more superior. Your uh, lesser pelvis is a little bit inferior, um, but you can see kind of how the two interact with uh, one another. And this is going to also define uh, the plane of the pelvic rim and kind of, again, the plane of the pelvic outlet and, and kind of what the relationship between those two uh, look like. Okay. So if we look at the anterior superior view of both the false and true hips, uh, you can see that here located in both pink and blue. So here's your false pelvis and here's your true pelvis. And again, um, given the different locations of these, you're having different organ systems kind of interact and kind of rest um, in these uh, regions. Okay, well, I guess ultimately that is I guess we did cover it all. Um, so uh, that's ultimately all I have for you today. Uh, please make sure you answer the study guide questions before coming to class on Tuesday. Um, I'll be posting this today, Friday, so you'll have a few days to, to watch it. Um, I'll try to get uh, the other Thursday's lecture um, posted on Monday. And uh, if you have any questions about this, please feel free to let me know. Again, I'm, I, I know that sometimes the study guide can be a little redundant. I'm going to try to really pull out ex specifically like the bones and structures I'm going to require you to know for the exam and post kind of a, a revamped uh, study guide. If you have not been attending class, it's probably not a bad time to just pop in uh, just because we are going over again things to know versus things you can kind of disregard. And so I think that makes studying just a little bit easier. Um, and also I'm going over the material basically like two times during that period. You're going through it with your group for them we're going through it collectively as a group. And then during that time while we're going over it collectively as a group and I'm presenting it, I'm also periodically asking you questions to kind of stimulate um, you know, those neurons. So uh, if anyone has any questions or concerns, please let me know. And uh, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Hopefully the weather sticks.
days the way it's been. It's been kind of a wonderful few last few days, wonderful fall days. Okay, see y'all later.